Hello. Namaskar. Namaskar. Good afternoon. Uh, today, uh, Mizoram University Aizol, uh, the Ek Bharat Shesht Bharat team is organizing this national webinar on Mahatma Gandhi on the occasion of the extended 150 years of Gandhi's birth anniversary. In this webinar, we have uh, Professor Bhagawan Jos, formerly with JNU New Delhi, and Professor Jos will talk about Gandhi, non-violence, and the colonial state, and Professor Sashi Joshi, formerly with University of Delhi, Gandhi and his Christian friends. We have uh, with us uh, Professor K.R.A. Sambhashiva Rao, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Mizoram University, who will give formal welcome. I have with me Professor K. Robin, Head Department of History and Ethnography, Mizoram University, as my co-organizer. And Professor Robin will speak about uh, our esteemed guest speakers. Then uh, myself, uh, Srinivas Pati, I teach public administration in Mizoram University. I will talk a little bit about both the themes. Then uh, we will have the sequence like this. Professor Bhagwan Jos will present his talk. After that, Madam Sashi Joshi will give her talk and take up the question and answer. After that, again, Professor Bhagwan Jos will rejoin and also take up the question and answer and formal vote of thanks. This way, we have to proceed. So without any further delay, I now request my colleague, Professor K. Robin, to give a formal welcome with introduction of Professor Bhagwan Jos and Professor Sashi Joshi. Professor Robin. Uh, respected sirs, dear colleagues, participants, very good afternoon to you. Uh, it is really heartening to have uh, eminent guest speakers, the likes of Professor Bhagwan Josh. Uh, of course, Professor Bhagwan Josh does not need any kind of introduction. He's known, uh, he's a reputed historian. Uh, for just formality's sake, I would just like to mention that Professor Bhagwan Josh uh, specialized in social and political history of uh, modern India. His, prof his former professor of uh, contemporary history at the Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. And uh, he has specialized on the Indian National Liberation Movement and is considered to be one of India's foremost scholars and on communist movements in India. He has written a number of uh, works, a number of books. His, some of his works include Struggle for Hegemony in India, Volume 2, A History of the Indian Communist, Culture, Community and Power. You know, here he deals on various perspectives of Indian history. He has done a lot of works on the colonial state, on different political parties, trade unions, and so on and so forth. And we are highly grateful to Professor Bhagwan Jost for uh, making himself available today on this uh, webinar. Sir, indeed, on behalf of Mizoram University, I would like to welcome you and also thank you. And uh, another guest speaker is Professor uh, Sashi Joshi. Professor Sashi, Sashi Joshi did her master's degree from uh, Delhi University, her MPhil and PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, Professor Sashi Joshi is also equally renowned historian. Uh, she was twice a fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, twice fellow of the uh, Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Shimla. She was also a short-term fellow at the Yale uh, Divinity School, Connecticut School of Divinity, Edinburgh, visiting fellow at Queen Elizabeth House, University of Oxford, the Southampton University, UK, the Maison de la Homme, Paris, and a visiting fellow at the Rico University, Tokyo. Uh, to her credit, one can uh, uh, 
see a lot of uh, publication, which includes a three volume study on nationalism titled Struggle for Hegemony in India and a three volumes on the history of Indian communist published by Sage, Mission, Religion and Caste. And of course, the last dubber, Oxford University Press. Ma'am, we are really thankful to you for coming online and being able to you know, share your views on Gandhi. Ma'am, thank you once again. Thank uh, you. Uh, so I would also take this opportunity to state that uh, our participants may kindly interact with our resource persons, our uh, guest speakers. You can put your questions in the drop box, Q and A box. And with this, I hand over our time to our chairman, Professor Srinivas Pati. Thank you, Professor Robin. Uh, now, uh, brief discussion about the theme. I have to introduce. Uh, suppose uh, Professor Bhagwan Jo's uh, topic is Gandhi, non-violence and the colonial state. A few years back, one guest came to Mizoram University, and somehow he was linked to one company, uh, TV company, and the name was Bag B A G. So someone from the uh, audience asked, "Sir, what is this bag?" He told this B A G, Bhavan, Allah, God. This sums of Gandhi. This sums of Gandhi. So people are saying, "Is this the name of a company?" They say, "Oh, sure, because we live in India, and India stands for that bag, not baggage of the past, but that bag where Bhagwan, Allah, and God they stay together, and we pray, and we also coexist. This is India." And Gandhi ji was the perfect case, past, present, and future, who has this idea in him that beyond any kind of barriers, you can have universalism, humanism, and the ideas that any universal system can stand for. So when we talk about non-violence, colonial state, satyagraha, and all these ideas. Every time somebody asks why Gandhi every year, every time, the answer is very simple. Like each generation of student, they have to be told A, B, C or any basics of any language. Similarly, Gandhi, if we study Gandhi, we know India, we know the world, we know humanity. Coming to Madam Sasi Joshi's topic, Gandhi and his Christian friends, a very interesting topic, which also talks about how Gandhi was linked to his Christian friends. We all know about uh, Dinabandhu Andrews, C.F. Andrews, and many others. But during his studies in London, his long stay in South Africa, negotiation, rounds and rounds of negotiation in London, his interactions with people of the British regime in India, Gandhi was interacting with so many Christian friends, not to forget the uh, people who came to Gandhi for an in interview. I am rem reminded of one small anecdote. One journalist from BBC, that time radio was very popular, came to meet Gandhiji in Sabanapati Ashram. So that the journalist asked, Bapu, what about your views on this world war, uh, what India should do? And said, wait, wait, I am just coming. Then when he, he followed, Gandhi was talking to a lamb because the lamb was not well, so he has to take care. Bapu, you talk about the lamb? I'm talking about world politics, world affairs. I said, no, no, equally important. The life of lamb, life of human beings. Maybe world war, maybe in my ashram. This is Gandhi. So with these brief words, I don't want to be a barrier. And now uh, uh, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Kere Sambhashwara Garu, to welcome our guests. Professor Sambhashiva Rao, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Mizoram University. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, pending that, again, on behalf of my university, my Vice Chancellor, because I am told that 
uh, Honorable VC is another urgent meeting now. So I formally welcome on behalf of the oh, university and on our personal behalf, our guest, the participants, and only one sentence for the participant before Dr. Hogan Josh goes live and talks. Dear participants, please post your queries, brief questions in the question and answer box. Then it will be taken up phase by phase. But if at all you need some other clarification, you can still write to us in the emails already given in the uh, seminar poster. So uh, with these few words, I have the privilege to request Dr. Bhagwan Jos to speak on Gandhi, non-violence and the colonial state. Professor Jos. Uh, first of all, I must begin by uh, thanking the Vice Chancellor, uh, <laughs> Professor Pati and Professor Robin Sir, can I uh, request uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor to come in kindly, sir, because he has uh, just come on live. So now uh, I request uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor K. Sambhashiva Rao Garu, to uh, welcome our Honorable Guest. Sir, you have just started. Well, we... Good afternoon, sir. I just, sorry, I joined with a little late. No, no, no problem, sir. Can kindly continue. Continue. Uh, continue. Sir, I welcome Professor Bhagavan Josh, uh, the former Professor of uh, Contemporary History, Center for Historical Studies, JNU. Uh, I welcome you, sir, for your kind acceptance to our university for speaking on Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, it is one of the important topic, uh, Gandhi, nonviolence, and the colonial state. Uh, where because as per the government of India, we started this program, uh, and we are kindly accepted for giving a lecture on this one. It is very great uh, uh, privilege for us. Uh, from an excellent person like you. And we are very happy, sir. Thank you very much for kind acceptance. I will be listening to you, sir. And uh, Professor Shashi Joshi, sir, former professor of uh, modern Indian history, Delhi University, Gandhi and his uh, Christian friend. It is a very beautiful topic, sir. Uh, I'm grateful for you because uh, it is uh, a topic which actually, which will be motivating all of us uh, because I never heard about this uh, topic uh, and uh, it is really great of you. And I will be listening and uh, I will be here, sir. All two lectures I will be listening. And uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, sorry. Now, I think uh, Professor Bhavan can continue. Please. Yeah. Uh, I must begin by thanking the Vice Chancellor, <laughs> Professor Pathi, and Professor <laughs> Robin uh, for inviting us to speak from the platform of Mizoram University. Uh, the theme of my talk today is Gandhi nonviolence and the colonial state. And I will be looking at all the three aspects of this topic. But let me say, why is it important to understand and discuss Gandhi? It's often said that where there is oppression, there will be resistance on Gandhian methods. And it's now absolutely clear what is happening in America and all over the world, people are following the Gandhian methods, despite the fact that there's so much of violence. But the philosophy and ideas of Gandhi at one level are simple, but another level, they are very, very complex. It is often said that Gandhi invented a radical and unique philosophy of opposing the oppressors. This is true. And there are two aspects of this, what is called the radical Gandhian philosophy. One is part is what I call the simple part is the part of Putes. Gandhi has been understood all over the world as a person who discovered methods of protesting and in a way that the protesters are not able to damage the others. The other part of Gandhian thing is the Gandhian strategy to capture state power or government from the hands of the oppressors. Now this part of the Gandhian strategy is not understood. And this is the main focus of our work. Shashi and I have spent 15 years trying to explore this idea of the Gandhian strategy. 
If you read books on Gandhi, there's a lot of things I've written on nonviolence. There's a lot of things written on protest. But did Gandhi possess a very unique kind of strategy to confront the modern states? That the scholars are silent about it. So let's first look at what did he do in South Africa? So when Gandhi was in South Africa, he organized mass movements and he was the man whose mass movements were ultimately succeeded there. But why did nonviolence succeed in India? That is the question which we will be trying to answer. If you look at the world history or global history, all the revolutions of the 20th century, and I mean revolution, violent revolution, they have taken place only against those states which were feudal absolutist state. No revolution has occurred till today against a state which had some semblings of democratic structure. And how should one oppose, this, oppose a state which has trappings of democratic constitutionalism? Because Marxists have never done anything to understand such a state. Gandhi developed a new kind of strategy, what one of the leading thinkers in Europe, who was a Marxist, Antonio Gramsci, named, called, labeled the strategy as war opposition. So here was Gandhi, unlike Mao, unlike Lenin, unlike Marx, he discovered a new strategy in human history to oppose the oppression of a state which has semi-authoritarian kind of character, which is also a kind of semi-liberal state. And the difference is that in South Africa, Gandhi experimented with the Putis. But when he came to India on such a vast scale and was confronted with a state which was already more than 100 years old in India, he tried to experiment new methods and discovered what we call the nonviolent strategy of mobilizing the millions against such a state. Now, every time there is a discussion about Gandhi, the scholars begin from Gandhi's stay in South Africa. He went to South Africa in 1893, and he came back to India in 1915, and he launched his movement on a number of issues. One of the issue was registration of certificates where Indians were asked to carry a certificate with their fingerprints. He said, this is a great humiliation and such certificates should be burnt. Then restrictions were placed on the migrant, migrant Indian migrants. They could not move within Africa from one province and other province Gandhi challenged that kind of restrictions also. And another serious thing in which he fought against the state there was invalidation of Indian marriages. The rulers there said that only Christian marriages were valid and any kind of Hindu, Muslim or Parsi marriage were not recognized. Their children were recognized as illegitimate. So Gandhi struggled for a long time and ultimately there were negotiations on these protest movements and decisions were taken in a manner which he approved of and were favorable to him. Now, but we are interested in it in not only this kind of empirical struggles, we are asking a different kind of question. And that is, what did Gandhi learn from these protest movements? And how did those kind of things which he learned in South Africa helped him to work out a new strategy to confront the colonial state in India. And this is where I will be elaborating two, three points. The first point is that Gandhi started from the assumption that your only enemy is fear. Fear is the only enemy of human beings. And it is said, those who fear, the fear eats the soul. Therefore, fear was the most important thing and Gandhi taught them that unless you learn fearlessness, you can't practice any kind of protest. And then he said, but fear emerges from the idea 
from absolute truthfulness you have to be truthful only a truthful person can be a fearless person and he told his followers that only truthfulness tells your conscience that what you are doing or demanding will not hurt others and he says if you are true you will never hurt others and the third point he wanted to say he says once you are fearless once you are truthful then you must develop a kind of conviction in you and this is the conviction which enables human beings to go through endless sufferings make sacrifices and even embrace martyrdom those people who lack convictions they cannot fight any battles and the other point which he registered was the kind of perseverance and persistence that you have to persist don't get demoralized because your goal is not being met immediately that is not the goal of satyagraha satyagraha is not victory at one stroke it is a long persistent struggle in that sense so he just spelled out four elements which went into the making of the nature of gandhian protest there are various kind of protest but i am talking of the gandhian protest which he conducted in south africa that is fearlessness truthfulness conviction and willing to sacrifice your life and if you possess these qualities only then you become a true satyagrahi and a soldier of non violent war in fact in india when he came he constantly was saying that what i am doing in india is waging a war i am not just conducting a protest in india and in fact the first non cooperation movement which he launched was a very difficult movement but it broke the barrier of fear and this is what muhammad ali who was having a united struggle with gandhi at that time said that our movement should be judged by the amount of fear it has succeeded in removing it was fear that had made 320 millions of our people the slaves of a 100000 englishmen that fear thank god is fast disappearing and india's thraldom is sure to disappear in the coming future as i said gandhi often was using the imagery of war for example in one of his resolutions gandhi wrote that civil disobedience requires the same strict discipline as an army organized for armed conflict the army is helpless unless it possesses its weapons of destruction and knows how to use them so also an army of non violent soldiers is ineffective unless it understands and possesses the essentials of non violence gandhi evolved in india a new kind of strategy a strategy which was able to steer clear the pitfalls of constitutional conformism on one side and armed misadventure on the other side in fact subhas boss could see at the very beginning of gandhian struggle and he said the success of the mahatma has been due to the failure of constitutionalism on one side and armed revolution on the other and it's very interesting when civil disobedience movement being conducted somebody asked even why you are so much dead pitted against a movement which is non violent which is not in hurting anybody he says we who are managing the government and the colonial state we know the power of this movement and he said we have only two choices before us either we abdicate power to the indians or we crush this movement so if you know the history of this movement the 1930 movement was crushed the 1942 movement was also crushed by the british but how did gandhi starting with the idea of protest come to the idea of a strategy of seizing power from a state which was very different in history and he understood from the very beginning that fear lies at the root of all states all states in human history they are built in fear and all rulers and their states have always built their base on fear 
and it is because of that the administration and the state continues but then he said there are wise rulers who rule not only by fear but they try to get the consent of the ruler the people over whom they ruled by convincing their rulers that our rule is permanent and beneficial to all the british were able to get the consent of the indian people to rule over them and therefore were able to win over their loyalty large number of indians were loyal to the british in fact british rule in india was just not like imposed rule through a process and policies and rules and regulations and central metma reviews and land systems they are able to and through courts and legal networks they were able to win over the loyalties of the indian let's look at very interesting statistics in the first world war in fact one of the interesting part of this is that british recruited the massive armies which defended their empire all over the world from india and the majority of that army was from punjab so if you look at the statistics of the first world war 74000 indians died while 67000s were wounded in the second world war 2.5 million soldiers were mobilized out of which 87000 were dead 34000 were wounded and 67000 became prisoners of war and in here i want to make a very provocative generalization and that generalization is that more indians went out into the world to defend the british empire as compared to the number of indians who went to jails in india to liberate themselves from the british rule it's an amazing kind of situation in no other country foreign rulers could recruit armies on this scale and yet continue to rule over this country and this was something which astonished tolstoy in a letter to mahatma gandhi he said i cannot understand how one lakh people british englishmen in india and at no stage they were more than 1 lakh in india could rule over a population of 330 millions how is it possible and he says there's only one way i can understand that is not the british who are ruling it is the large section of the indians who are helping them to rule over india and this insight was a very important insight for gandhi that if india was being ruled with the help of the indians that is with the consent of the indians then british rule will crumble moment that consent is withdrawn so all his movements which he launched were an attempt to withdraw consent from the colonial rulers and thereby creating a crisis there in their rule and compelling them to think should we continue to rule by consent or should we resume the way we have been ruling before 1857 in fact 1857 was a crucial moment in in the history of british state because for the first time they start universities colleges and they allowed the press to work freely there were thousands and hundreds of newspaper all over india and as a result of this education and these th developments new intelligentsia was born the project of modernity began to be embraced by the indian intelligentsia and they allowed a free press the reform movements began and some of these britishers also helped them to participate in the reform movements in fact this further enhanced the prestige and the moral authority of the british over indian society that here are people their rule is the rule of law it's not law less less rule as it was before the arrival of the british and gandhian struggle was born out of this deep understanding that rulers can continue to rule only when the ruled are willing to cooperate with the rulers when the ruled refuse to cooperate with the rulers that rule cannot be continued it will crumble and will be compelled 
to attack the audience and the ordinary people. In fact, all those rulers who lose credibility, who rule, lose legitimacy, who lose the consent to be ruled, resort to open violence. And Gandhi said, that is the moment when we need to resist with peaceful thinking. Everybody can resist a state when it's not in violent mood, but the crucial thing is to resist a state when it is violently attacking people. But as I said, we must come to a question which is the central piece of my argument. And that question is, why did nonviolence succeed in India? It did not. The movement, if you look around national movements in China and Vietnam, they were very violently fought national movements. They were led by the communists. While in India, the national movement led by a man who believed in nonviolence and the communists who wanted to overthrow the British rule with the help of arms were marginalized. And this is the central question. This is also the question, why was there no revolution in India? The most important legacy which the India has inherited from the British rule is highly centralized and fully armed colonial state. And its bureaucracy was very effective in perpetuating the rule of the Brits and keeping the Indians at bay and oppressing them and this state has been inherited by the new rulers after 1947. This state since then has never been transformed. It has never become a people state, a truly democratic state in India. Here was a semi-liberal, semi-authoritarian state we inherited from the British. Earlier, only 14% of the people could rule. Now it was universal voting rights to the people. But the, as far as the nature of the colonial state is concerned, that was never dismantled, never changed. In fact, from the very beginning, when the British rule came to India, now here I would like to give you a historical sketch how the colonial state evolved in India. And that historical sketch is very important for my argument. It will take me a few minutes to sketch the evolution of the colonial state in India. From the very beginning, that is from 1830s, the British were faced with the idea, what kind of state we should build in India? Because India was so vast and they were alien rulers. What kind of state could sustain our rule? And that was the question which they debated among themselves. There are a lot of discussions between them in fact, much before 1857, the British were debating this issue. And this is what Macaulay said in the House of Commons in 1833. And it's a very fascinating uh, idea, which I like to quote. The destinies of, of our Indian empire are covered with thick darkness. It's difficult to form any conjecture as to the fate reserved for a state which resembles no other in history and which forms by itself a separate class of political phenomena. The laws which regulate its growth and its decay are still unknown to us. This is what he said in 1833 in the House of Commons. But the most important thing is, which he claims that they are building a state which resembles no other in history. Therefore, Indian state, the colonial state, was a very unique kind of history. There has never existed a colonial state like this anywhere in the world. And this state ruled India with the Aaron Fisk till 1857. Then there was a revolt of 1857. And the debate between those who wanted to rule India with the help of Indians and those who wanted to rule India with the help of force, that debate sharpened. And ultimately, it's people like Macaulay, people like Trevelyan, people like Charles Grant, they agreed that in India, the British have won a precarious power. The real power will be if we are able to win over the head and hearts of the Indian people. We must enshrine our loyalty in their hearts. And unless we do this, one like British people will not be able to rule 
over 330 million people on such a vast landmass. And it is after 1957, as I said earlier, universities were open for higher education. Then colleges were open, schools were open, research institutes were open, open in this country, and the press was open in this country. A public sphere, a very vibrant public sphere was created where discussion and debates can took place among the various intellectuals with different kind of agendas. And it is this which created the Indian intelligentsia and helped them to imbibe European modernity at that time. And it was a both kind of modernity, a modernity which was very progressive and also a modernity which was very conservative. Sometimes people think that there's no such thing as conservative modernity, but India does imbibe a conservative modernity where people sought to combine the European values with what they call indigenous native values. But the most important thing which the British brought, colonial state was brought and which we Indians must recognize, and that was the rule of law. After 1793, the colonial authorities declared that even the colonial systems and colonial, colonial policies must be subjected to rule of law. And in this rule of law, everybody is equal, every individual is equal. Now, in a sense, here was a colonial state, but it spelled out a very revolutionary principle. And that revolutionary principle was that everybody is equal in the eyes of law. And to enunciate this principle in Indian society, which was written with hierarchies, was a very revolutionary principle. And in fact, it, till today, our society has not been able to systematically establish and observe this rule of law. Every day you hear the news, every day you hear the incident where rule of law is flouted by the government and by the people in that sense who are in powerful position. Therefore, rule of law, which was a central tenet of the British, which they brought here, continues to have problems with itself. Then, as I said, the debate has taken place between the British on various issues. And the important thing was that colonial state in India was colonized by a state which had a British parliament. Therefore, the things were debated in British parliament. And Indian bureaucracy was constantly hassled by the idea that whatever they do in India, they will be held responsible in the British Parliament. Question will be asked. So the, here was a very sensitive bureaucracy that they should not act in a manner that they are criticized in the British Parliament there. So some of the discussions of the British Parliament was between the liberals on one side and the conservatives on the other side. And the crucial thing was that liberals wanted to rule India, as I said, with much more liberal ideas in which natives were supposed to be associated with the British rule, in which there was a freedom of press, in which the kind of repression which was let loose on the Indians and complete civil liberties were totally denied to them, the liberals stood for partial civil liberties. While the other side were exactly opposite of it. Now, given this way in which sometime the viceroy, one viceroy will come and liberal policies will be implemented, then next time an, a conservative viceroy will come and exactly the, the exactly different policy will be implemented. So there was a constant tension between liberal principles on one side and the authoritarian principle on the other side. In fact, it is the struggle between two principles and their result in that the Indian state was structured in a, in a way. So there were a liberal principle in the foundation of the Indian state, and there are authoritarian principle in the Indian state, and they continue to exist till today. As I said, this state has never been dismantled to fully democratize itself and make it a people's state, people-oriented state. It, it has authoritarian character, which is historically inbuilt into it, because of the nature of the colonial state. But <clears throat> the 
Then the question that the British faced, and it's very interesting, this question they faced in 1838. And they said, what are the ways open to Indians? Suppose Indians to get freedom. How can they get freedom from us? They said there are two ways the Indians can get freedom from us. One is they called through the medium of revolution and other through that of reform. In one, the forward movement is sudden and violent. In the other, it's gradual and peaceable. No doubt, both these schemes of national improvement suppose the termination of English rule. But while that event is the beginning of one, it is only the conclusion of the other. In one, the sudden and violent overthrow of our government is a necessary preliminary. In the other, a long continuance of our administration and gradual withdrawal of it as the people become fit to govern themselves are equally indispensable. So here was a remarkable formulation that is Indians have the two strategies open to them only. One is through the process of reform. They keep on petitioning us and we continue to reform and give them little bit reforms and keep opening up the state. First, we give them little bit 5% kind of legislation, then we give 14% universal suffrage, and then we can continue. The other is they said they can also pose up through revolution. And Trevelyan divided these, oppose, these forces into two camps. He said in the one, there are camp in India, they are so restless and they want sudden and absolute expulsion of the English. Mind you, this was written in 1838 and this happened in 1857. But he says, there are other people in India and very few who don't dimly look forward in the distant future to the establishment of national representative assembly as the consummation of their hopes. So there are people who can look distant into the future and they want a constitutional government in this country. And then he said, then what should we do? He said, we should act in a manner and have designed policies where we keep crushing those who try to make a sudden revolution and slowly open the tap for the other side of reformer side to widen their activities in this country and work among, uh, within the framework of colonial constitutionalism. We'll give them freedom, but that freedom will be within the colonial constitutionalism. Not, we will not permit them freedom outside it. And they said, how can we do it? He said, you can do it if we teach the Indians to put themselves on the idea of a self-government on European model. So we should act in a manner that Indians look forward to a parliamentary system. And this is said in 1838. And if we do that, then what we'll do, we will be able to prolong our rule in, 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 Brit, in, in, in uh, India. Why? They said, then it will take minimum 100 years to Indians to teach national self-government and the rules of the national government. But a Maratha or a Mohammedan despotism might be reestablished in a month, but a century would scarcely suffice to prepare the people for self-government on the European model. The political education of a nation must be a work of time. And when it is in progress, we shall be as safe as possible. So if we, we cannot have a permanent rule in India, but we have a choice. Do we want to rule through constitutional colonialism? Then we can have a prolonged rule. How long? That will determine on the kind of opposition. But if we don't do it, then there will be a violent response to us, which happened in 1857. And that will try to reestablish an old model, a Maratha rule or a Mughal rule in this country. So we have a choice. Now, ultimately, the British choose the second model. They set the Indians on to the path of European model by introducing press, by introducing colleges, libraries, universities, public sphere, and discussing the European institution of democracy and by slowly opening up the constitutional affair. From the end of the 1880s, the self-government's ideas begin to permeate in India. There were 
municipalities which were elected municipalities there were district boards and slowly over a period legislative councils were established in different provinces of india to govern india through a cons colonial constitutionalism so if i have to sum it up over a period the colonial state evolved an inbuilt strategy to perpetuate itself on the one hand it tried to manipulate and convert all forms of opposition into constitutional forms in order to absorb them within its framework by giving small concessions while on the other it drove underground all the revolutionary movements which sought to oppose the british who friendly attacked the state with the aim of evolving an insurrectionary perspective in the long run and it then took steps to disorganize and scatter them in other words it was difficult it was not difficult for the colonial state to neutralize and contain those forces which either followed the strategy of insurrection against them or who followed the idea of a constitutionalism I and mean, we know the fate of the gadar party we know the fate of bhagat singh we know the fate of bengal revolutionaries and the communists who sought to oppose the colonial rule with the help of arms the government came with a heavy hand drove them underground and destroyed them while on the other hand the constitutional struggles they were giving bit of concessions in this thing but they have never thought that there is a possibility of a new strategy against us which be neither a constitutional like the gokhale and others and the pre gandhian congress and which will not be violent like the insurrectionary politics of the gadarites bhagat singh and communists and this is where gandhi's significance come he invented a new form of strategy which is neither constitutional nor it insurrection he invented a strategy of peaceful mass movement of the masses and in fact this is the strategy which goes on in the global context today everywhere people are trying to follow this strategy and in fact i should conclude in this because it uh, i'm uh, overshooting the time it has been observed that satyagraha has introduced a new kind of fight and a new kind of strategy there is no doubt that as military science had advanced through the ages each generation adding to it so will non violent strategy advance in time and i think i am sure people are experimenting this strategy against all oppressors in the world but here at the end i must also underline the limitation just one minute limitations of the gandhian movements if you look at the accumulated impact of all the three movements non cooperation civil disobedience and quit india movement they produced the impact on the british where they stopped them from ruling over indian society they were able to paralyze their rule but they were never strong enough to throw them out and decide whatever they want to decide their fate therefore the british were very much very much present on the partition table and they played a very crucial role in the partition of this country it's very interesting thing which i want to discuss but there is no time what happened to the gandhian strategy in the aftermath of 1947 is there anyone who is following that strategy and this is where i was willing to discuss strategy followed by anna hazare and the movement he generated which ultimately resulted in the formation of political party under arvind kejriwal which is ruling in delhi so i must stop here i am sure there will be number of questions and later on after professor joshi i will be taking those questions thank you very much okay sir thanks now uh, uh, it's a privilege to welcome uh, professor sasi joshi madam now it's your turn so Uh, first your talk and then a little bit of uh, questions queries uh, you can take up so now uh, uh, professor uh, joshi please thank you very much 
<clears throat> Good afternoon to everyone. <coughs> um, I, I have to first record my thanks to all those who are responsible for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to make a presentation today. Um, I chose uh, the topic of Gandhi and, uh, and his Christian friends, but it is rather long and extremely uh, complex. And it has a lot of original research material. And there was certainly no time for me to present all that. So I wrote this uh, book uh, in Gandhi's, you know, in uh, Gandhi's arc. So in this, I have discussed at length, <coughs> um, excuse me, I have discussed at length the um, relationship of both Charles Freer Andrews a very close friend and, uh, you know, compatriot and uh, friend for Gandhi. And uh, also Veria Elvin, who was in the Northeast a lot, and I thought that would be interesting, but that requires a totally separate, uh, you know, talk. Uh, now, what I think that I can do is essentially read to you some bits from what I have already written. Um, it is a small segment of uh, my entire work. And um, I think if you have the opportunity to read it, there could be more fruitful discussions in the future. Now, during uh, the 20s and 40s uh, in India, a large number of Western men and women, predominantly Christian, were drawn to India and to Gandhi. Both many came for India, but a large segment came for Gandhi. Some were members of movements which shared an aversion to industrial civilization. And the loss of humanity that they saw that had occurred in personal relationships that and social relationships that resulted from the increased materialism of the new world, uh, the post First World War world, which they were observing and the chaos that followed after that. Now, uh, there were many others who felt a great nostalgia for a pre-capitalist society, a society in which pre-industrial society, and uh, they were some, a very few of them were Christian socialists as well. Now they ranged from pacifists to advocates of women's rights, enthusiasts who had rediscovered nature and the care uh, of you know, human life through natural therapies and so on. It was a wide ranging kind of uh, you know, platform that they occupied. There were those who came to see Gandhi. There were those who were founders of rural communes uh, new social relationships were being experimented with. There were proto-ecologists already. Many small movements were there against industrial society. And they were all, you know, uh, under the uh, broad flag of saving society, world society, and the earth from destruction. The world war itself had played havoc, and that was a great lesson to them as well. Now, Gandhi himself uh, was as inspired as most of them. Once he was in England, and he was exposed to various writers and people whom he could uh, discuss with and interact with, uh, he himself was inspired by Thoreau and Emerson, and of course, Ruskin, and most of these people whom I'm talking of, they all came uh, after being inspired by the same writers. And many of them were uh, you know, available to Gandhi for the first time when he went to England. Now, with the images of Christ and of St. Francis of Assisi, which were, which, they were the dominant images in the minds of, the, of Western society and those who were uh, interested in natural, ecological, and many movements which were uh, 
you know, upset with the industrialization, which had played havoc and the armaments that were unleashed. Now, the primary, uh, you know, work that really threw Gandhi's significance into world, uh, you know, knowledge was the biography that was written by Romain Rolla. And, uh, but before that, even before Rolla, you could say the portrait of a Christ-like Gandhi, which became very popular in Britain, America, and in Europe, uh, this portrait was first seen in the biography written by Reverend Joseph Dokes. Now, Joseph Doak was an English Baptist, and uh, he was extremely sympathetic to the cause of Indians in South Africa, even before he met Gandhi. Doak presented his meeting and encounter with Gandhi, which he sought, and he met and spoke with him, he, uh, and read of him. He uh, presented this as playing a further role in his experience. And he compared him to Jesus Christ. Now, this was something which could be considered quite blasphemous by those who were, uh, you know, proper churchmen and who were not experimenting with the ideas of the new world that was now opening up post-World War. After Dokes, there was a Unitarian pastor. His name was John Haynes Holmes. He played a role in furthering this comparison between Gandhi and Christ. Uh, Holmes was a leading figure of liberal Protestantism in the United States. He delivered a sermon in the Unitarian Church in New York as early as 1921. And he said that when I think of Gandhi, I think of Jesus. He lives his life, he speaks his words, he suffers and strives, and prophetically he said, someday Gandhi will nobly die for this and for his kingdom upon earth. Of course, as I mentioned, Romain Rolla's uh, work uh, and biography, which was published in 1923, was a runaway success because his right, he was already a very enormously influential man, Romain Rolla. And therefore, when Rolla likened Gandhi to St. Francis of Assisi and drew a picture of Gandhi embodying a Christ-like simplicity, uh, this was something that seeped into the consciousness of a large number of Western intellects. Comparing Gandhi with Tolstoy, Rola also said that uh, while Tolstoy was a Christian by his will, he willed it, but Gandhi was a Christian by nature. It is in the universal sense. And in the context of the European intelligentsia's overwhelming preoccupation with peace during this period after the war, there was a great churning of ideas and minds, and most of this was steeped in biblical references. Most of their, uh, you know, peace and uh, other sort of forward-looking ideas were steeped in biblical references. And Gandhi was often seen as a messiah or sort of a Christ-like figure. And this became a prominent motive throughout the Anglo-Saxon Protestant Christendom, particularly in the United States, which was the leading, uh, you know, people who uh, presented Gandhi in that way. There were fewer Catholics, there were some few Catholics who were followers of uh, a Catholic, uh, you know, Frenchman of Italian origin called uh, uh, Lanza del Vasto. He was a French citizen, but he became the main propagator of Gandhism in France. Now his narration of his encounter with Gandhi in 1936 sold 200,000 copies at the time of the German occupation of France. And for that time, this was an extremely enormous figure uh, to sell. On Gandhi's assassination, Lanza del Vasto observed to a meeting that was held, a memorial meeting that was held, he said that we should seek hope in this tragedy, this tragedy of the assassination of Gandhi. We must see hope in it because 
we, this is the way the Christ-like figures meet their fate. And both men died deaths which were violent, as befitted men of non-violence. Men of non-violence, it befits them to die deaths of violence because they will not raise an arm against anyone. Now, Gandhi, of course, was anathema uh, to the colonial uh, authorities and to the English ruling class in Britain. And many of his supporters and admirers in England were therefore anti the ruling class. They were Quakers and they were generally Protestants. Now, several of the committed Christians of deep faith belonging to various denominations also had a very close relationship with Gandhi in England, in South Africa, as well as in India when Gandhi returned to the country. None, however, as we all know and have heard of, were closer to him than Andrews and Beria Relvin. Both came to India, interestingly, as missionaries. Both were from middle-class England. Both came from the same Oxford and Cambridge, and they were educated there, where the educated elite formed the imperial administrators. So they shared the same class and the same education. So this was, in fact, one of the greatest supports that Gandhi received when he was in England. Now, I must say that many in India, when Gandhi uh, is spoken of in India, uh, many in India were rather ignorant about Christianity. And uh, most of them were also, uh, you could say, you know, annoyed with the conversions and the Christianization of some parts of the uh, people. So they were familiarized, most people in India were familiarized with Christian thought by Gandhi's frequent quotations from the New Testament and from the Christian Gospels. It was he who quoted consistently from the Gospels and the New, Gospel, uh, New Testament. And the exemplary friendship between Andrews and Gandhi also underscored the universal elements and values which were embedded in their respective religions. And both of them, interestingly, Andrews and Gandhi, evolved for themselves original you know, religions, the universal elements in their religion, which transcended race, geography, and history. Now, Gandhi and Andrew sought to demonstrate in their living practice how religion could function in a creative manner and erase their competitiveness in the world, religious competitiveness in the world. This was, of course, in contrast to those who were hostile to both of them, those who castigated Gandhi as anti-Hindu because he sought to, uh, you know, spread and propagate Christian ideas through the New Testament and the Gospels, and those who accused Andrews of hobnobbing with quote-unquote Hindus like Gandhi and betraying Christianity. So on both uh, sides of the barricades, so to speak, of the religious divide, they were the ones who were leading the ministry of conciliation, the ministry of reconciliation between them. Now for Charlie Andrews, the source of inspiration, inspiration as he constantly repeated was Jesus Christ. And one of his most telling uh, writings said that Mahatma Gandhi has taught me more than any living person to face up to the true significance of the Sermon on the Mount. And we all know the Sermon on the Mount was the most favorite you know, sermon of Gandhi's. And Andrew said that he, it is Gandhi who has made me see that it is a practical method of overcoming evil in the world. It is not an only an idealistic notion, it is a practical method. Writing of their deep bond, Andrews said that it springs from a common concern that both of us have for the poor and the oppressed in the country and in the world. And we have a common faith in the ultimate power and reality of love. These are the things that unite us together. 
and Andrews hailed Gandhi, therefore, in his concept of Ahimsa and his concept of Satyagra, and said it was born of a same, similar spirit as his own Christian inspiration. Andrews said, my own Christian inspiration is similar. And he puts us to shame because his example has set me seriously thinking, writes Andrews. What he calls satyagra or truth force is absolutely Christian from my point of view. Now, Gandhi's personality in the midst of all the struggles that he indulged in in South Africa, that he led in, organized and led in South Africa, when Andrews first met him there, he said, for a moment, he appeared to me, his personality appeared to me so Hindu, and yet he was so supremely Christian. So therefore, many colored conscious Christians could not accept this and did not accept Andrew's point of view also. It took them quite some time to do so in the conditions of South Africa. Now, both Andrews and Gandhi believed that competitive religiosity, where religions compete with each other, is an obstacle both to truth and to Christian faith, and it is an irreligion. And this irreligion and competitive religiosity is related to materialism. And that materialism is re related to, quote unquote, the modern man, they say. Now, the main plank of their relationship thus was a common belief in being present, having a presence among the poor, the needy, the sick, and the afflicted. What Andrews called the road of the cross. He said the road of the cross is there for both of us to follow. And he wrote that Jesus has many lovers of his kingdom, but very few bearers of his cross. So he saw himself and Gandhi as being committed to you know, bearing the cross. And he writes, Gandhi put the cross into politics, not, did not leave it in religion. He put the cross in politics. Now, Gandhi shared the spirit of Andrews to the letter uh, and in spirit, though he said, I cannot claim to be a Christian in the sectarian sense of the term. Uh, and Andrews, you know, has reached out to me as somebody who is not a sectarian Christian, but the example of Jesus, he said, and the suffering of Jesus is a factor in the composition of my underlying faith in nonviolence. It is Jesus who informs my underlying faith. And all my actions, whether they are worldly or they are temporal. In uh, reminiscing about his younger days, he said, I had gone to South Africa from Gujarat from Kathiawari intrigues and for gaining a livelihood and getting some work to do. But he says, once I was there, I found myself in search of God and striving for self-realization. And I began to realize more and more the infinite possibilities of universal love. Now for this transformation in his life, Gandhi recorded his gratitude to his Christian associations and friends in London and in South Africa. He was forever thankful to their stimulation of his religious quest and he publicly thanked them and wrote to them and said that it is through religious discussions with them and reading the books that they had recommended both in England and in South Africa, that he was able to maintain a progressive interest and to develop his ideas. Even when he came back to India, he had maintained a close relationship, very close friendship with most of the Christian missionaries he had known in England and South Africa. Of course, in India, one missionary with whom he became quite close was Dr. Stanley Jones, who was an extremely interesting person who established the Satal Ashram in India near Nenital. And this Satal Ashram was a Gandhi-style Indian ashram that was set up by Stanley Jones. Along with many other Christians in the world, and uh, people like Elvin and Andrews, Jones also 
credited Gandhi for reviving an interpretation and a reinterpretation of the cross in India. Wrote Dr. Jones, never in human history has so much light been shed on the cross as has been shed through this one man. And that man is not even called a Christian. And he is not one. Of course, Gandhi related Christian teaching to his own beliefs. It's not as if he was adopting something completely uh, wholesale or foreign to him. He saw in the cross a process of learning and explication of the concept of ahimsa. So the terminology and the understanding is his own. The understanding of ahimsa is one which he interprets not only in the practice of nonviolence, but as love, charity in thought and deed following the ministry of Jesus Christ. He says, this is what I'm following in this respect. He related the implications of the cross and the kingdom of God, what he translated into Ram Raj, the kingdom of God that was spoken about by Jesus as well as Tolstoy who wrote on the kingdom of God. He said, he called it Ram Rajya and the need for reform in religions as they degenerate over time. So he spoke openly and consistently of the degradation that had crept into the practices in Hindu uh, you know, thought or uh, ideas or actual practice in India. He did not flinch from joining the missionaries, however much he criticized them. He criticized the missionaries, he uh, asked them not to be so offensive, and he insisted that they needed to reconcile, reconcile themselves to the people and the cross in India. But he said that the discriminatory practices of untouchability, caste divisions, and so on, and other injustices are something that I will not deny. And he never ever refused to recognize the truth of the missionary criticism of those elements. Though he said the way to handle those and to the way to work with them was to work with the people of India and of those who were even non-Christians. They had to work with them. Now, of course, this is something that his understanding with which he appealed, um, you know, even in India later on. The only thing that he did not agree with or go along with was a question of converting people. He said, I will not stand for conversion. We must all follow our religions as truthfully and ethically as we must and we should. Now to go back in time from this, uh, I would say that the West gave Gandhi religion in the first place. This is how I have read back into it. In the India of his youth, the overwhelming aspiration of most of the upper class and upper caste Indians in the country was to have an English education and to follow a secular path and to be modern, quote unquote, modern education and to become modern. The colonial Indian had turned away from all Indian ways, thrown them out, bag and baggage, and they sought to emulate Western ideas and lifestyles. And mind you, Gandhi was no exception. He was also following the same trajectory and the same path, and he went off to England to do precisely that, to become an Englishman. But when he described his annoyance, even though he was angry with some missionaries as a youth, he, he talks about it, how he was upset with them, but he was not a religious person by any means from the start. He was neither ritualistic, nor was he doctrinal in terms of re reading scriptures. He never read the scriptures. His only contact with religion was through his parentage and his mother. His first contact was with so-called Indian religion was with the, through the two theosophists who were uh, the Knightley brothers. And they were reading Edwin Arlen's worst translation of the Gita, Gita in, in verse. And they asked Gandhi, who was hapless, and said, please help us with the Sanskrit translation. Now, this is an anecdote which is well known. And Gandhi writes in his autobiography that he felt ashamed of himself because he had neither read the Sanskrit nor had he even read the Gujarati version. So it is in England that he began to read the song Celestial by Edwin Arnold of the translation of the Gita in verse, and he began to read it in English. Now, therefore, 
you can see that he is learning, borrowing with an extremely open mind and a Catholicity of spirit. He has a great Catholicity of spirit. And his empathy with many of his Christian friends was because of this. Now, how would he reconcile that with his friendship with people like Edward Maitland and Anna Kingsford? And how did it help him to acquire and evolve his own religious understanding? Mind you, it's an independent, uh, evolving religion and religious understanding of his own. It's not something that he borrows from anybody, but he interacts with all of them. And he says that these people, Maitland and uh, Kingsford, organized what was called the Esoteric Christian Union. And Gandhi immediately became a member of it. And he began corresponding with Maitland, and he corresponded with him till Maitland died, as long as he was alive. He read all the books that they sent to him. And he said that he found in, in them the support for his own kind of belief system. A belief system, quote unquote, which he said is a modern belief system. I don't believe in antique systems. I believe in the modern belief system. And this is what I have been able to evolve in interaction with these people and reading what they have been sending me. He said that the... Uh, belief that the true religious belief lies is not in the sepulcher of whole historical tradition, but in man's own mind and heart. And this is the religion that I have to plumb the depths of. And it's stress on Christian mysticism. It's giving up, abandoning all claims to orthodoxy and exclusive truth. No claims to exclusive truth were made by the esoteric Christian union. And this appealed to Gandhi's heart extremely, um, you know, and he said later in life that it is these elements that I have sought to stress, spirituality and soul, the mind and the heart against any defined boundaries. Now, the impression that Maitland made on Gandhi was obviously very great. And he wrote letters to the editor. He'd gone off to South Africa by then. And he wrote letters saying that the system of thought that Maitland and Kingsford propounded in their work was um, appealed to the new modern mind. It appeals to me. And uh, it reconciles all religions apart from Christianity, besides Christianity, including Christianity, and they present it as the same eternal truth, the core of eternal truth. Now, when Gandhi spoke of these, what are probably uh, eternal verities, you know, of, of religion, he said that he was now evolving his own ideas and he uh, went off, when he went off to South Africa. This brought a very decisive change in the political and spiritual sphere. And this became very noticeable in Gandhi from 1906. We all know that he established his first newspaper there, Indian Opinion. He set up Phoenix Farm, which he called Tolstoy Farm to begin with. And uh, it was known as Phoenix Farm only later. His friends and colleagues in South Africa, the Pollocks, Pollocks who were well known, um, you know, Henry and Millie Graham, uh, they were his very close friends. Uh, Pollack was from a Jewish family and Millie was from a Christian background. And both of them were attracted to the ethical society and it was probably they who introduced Gandhi to the activities of all the ethical societies in England. And they were, as I said, very close friends and they were constant interlocutors of each other. They would discuss and interlocute with each other. The other, uh, you know, source from which Gandhi learned a lot was from the women's suffrage movement, the suffragette movement in England. It was a very formative experience for Gandhi. And his encounter with the women's suffrage movement left him admiring all the spirited women whom, who were participating in it. He quoted them, he wrote about them, he sent back articles on them. And one of them, Mrs. Cobden, who was the head of, you know, the uh, one, the suffragette group, he said that I admire her extremely because she, he, he quoted her, she said that she had been arrested and put in prison. And she said, I will not 
get any special treatment, ask for any special treatment, despite education and all that, you know, the British legal laws which gave special privileges to people of education and class. She said, I, will re I refuse to take any privileges. I shall seek no favor from the state or from the police. I am in jail for my own and my sister's rights, and I will live like a common prisoner until the franchise to the women is granted. Now, this experience was to resonate with Gandhi powerfully. And in all his later years, every time he went to prison, this was his stand consistently. No favors, no uh, privileges, nothing. He was going to, you know, handle the thing. Please do tell me when I, if I, I'm overshooting. Now it is, you must, uh, you know, give credit to the fact that Gandhi was citing the women's suffragette movement much before he discovered Thoreau's civil uh, civil disobedience. Find up? No, no. Can you take off, ma'am? Few queries, few questions. Can we take Sorry? off? Sorry. Few questions. Can we take off? Right First, now. Few questions. Could I please yeah. just finish yeah. off quickly? Okay. 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 So Gandhi was, as I said, so inspired by the suffragette movement. He learned from them, and he, when he went back to when he was in South Africa, and also when he went back to India, he launched the women's active participation, as you know. Till then, there was no active participation of women in any mass movement, whether in South Africa or in India. It is he who initiated it for, because of this kind of inspiration. Now, the middle-class friends that he had introduced him to the poor in London. And, uh, you know, he met all of them. He met not only the very poor, but the factory workers and the laboring classes. He, he was uh, part of the groups which were nonconformist bodies. All the nonconformist bodies, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Wesleyans, Baptists, Society of Friends, so on. They were all different classes and wide ranging. And Gandhi learned from all of them. He had a completely open mind and he picked and chose what he thought would be useful for his evolving his own belief system, his religion, and his work of political enfranchisement in India and working amongst the poor of India. So therefore, much has been made of vegetarianism and so on, that he was a vegetarian and joined that society there. You, we must not forget, it was not a dietary choice but a part of a weekly which wanted to promote the uh, happiness of humanity, the happiness and health of humanity, the purity of human beings. And the uh, president of the society constantly cited the scriptures as something from the Christian gospel that had to be followed if they wanted to be righteous. Now, this appealed to Gandhi a lot, and he was extremely, uh, you know, uh, influenced by all of it. Now, uh, do I just wind up in two minutes or should I continue? Uh, I think, ma'am, let us take a few queries, okay? So, okay, okay. Yeah. 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 So, should I call from Professor Bhagwan or me? Yeah, so sure, we'll do it. But ah. on behalf of the university, I say a big thank you to uh, Professor Sasi Joshi. So there are so many questions, but let us take up a few because okay. of time. Okay. Okay. After you, Professor Bhagwan will come in and he has to reply to a few queries. Right. There is one question, hmm. the struggle of Gandhi against untouchability and the anti-caste ideas. Hmm. Can there be any link between these two? Anti-caste ideas in India hmm. and each struggle against untouchability. How do you look at this issue? Uh, well, I think that even though he has been spoken of as, uh, you know, accepting the Varana system, nevertheless, caste as it had become, uh, you know, petrified uh, in society and also uh, given institutionalization by the colonial uh, government. So this was something that he opposed politically. But on the other hand, any kind of discrimination whether it was on caste, class, or you know, gender uh, relationships, he was extremely opposed to all of them. So there is therefore this kind of differentiation that he makes. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Another issue is, did Gandhi 
had any kind of preference for a religion or a few religions or how do you link it with gandhi's sarva dharma samanvaya or all religions are same uh, what yeah. is the link between these two any preference for any particular or a few religions or all religions are same how do you look at no, this no this is quite um, quite clearly articulated by gandhi himself he said that he was a hindu he would remain a hindu he was born a hindu he would remain a hindu but what kind of hindu that is for him to choose he is going to choose what sort of hindu he is going to be and it's no nobody can dictate to him any any such thing so that is what i mean when i say that he evolved his own religious ideas in interaction with everybody with all other religions and other religious figures okay there is one yeah. issue uh, the christian mythical ideas versus a struggle for uh, this um, india and against hegemonic power so uh, what connection is there the christian mythical ideas and his struggle christian, against sorry i i didn't get that the christian mythical ideas and he struggle christian okay. mythical ideas and uh, as propounded by many of his uh, christian friends the writers yes. the experts yes also he struggle against hegemony hegemonic power so how can you make a link between these two mythic christian okay. Okay. ideas and his struggle yes. against hegemony yes yes i understand no no the point is here that when he speaks of hegemonic power of the british or of the colonial government he is talking in terms of overthrowing colonial power and it's a power struggle when he is talking about societal social change and change in the field of you know ecumenical thought and of ethical thought there he is he, he is in fact opposed to any hegemonic struggle at all in fact he says that there can be no uh, hegemony of any group or any religious formation because all of them have to as i said earlier he and andrews appealed for the ministry of reconciliation the ministry of united religious thought on the basis of truth sacrifice purity and self sacrifice and satyagraha so these were the things that he spoke about and uh, charlie andrews said that satyagraha his his satyagraha is really the same thing as my christian belief and uh, in fact jesus from that point of view is one of the first satyagrahis according to charles andrews yeah so he gives credit to gandhi for this term which he says fits the person persona of jesus christ and jesus christ ministry in the world yeah ma'am you told that uh, jesus and gandhi yeah. the the figure the yes. ideas yes. the values both of them stood for so there have been many comparisons criticism appreciation so yes. the question here is did gandhi influence christianity of any denomination for that matter in any way uh, which uh, from your research you could find that hmm. gandhi's influence on christianity per se or on any denomination in particular so from your writing from your research could you give yeah. it yeah from my research i see no such thing and in fact i think that's not even a valid question mm. that is the kind of question which is extremely uh, you know convoluted it's not a question which actually can be asked of people of faith of continuous uh, sacrifice of those who are willing to put their lives on the line and say we don't mind being you know destroyed and killed and you know we be willing to give our lives up for the beliefs of people of our people and your people all of them it's not something that is uh, you know segregated between them that is one of his main platforms and so the friends that he made were those who agreed with him on this you know okay thank you ma'am i think we can continue but due yeah. to procedure of time i yeah. must say thank you to you so can you kindly um, make uh, professor bhavan uh, here so that we can ask something to professor yes. josh yes i'll just call him right thank you thank you hello ah hello. yeah welcome back sir sir there are there are many queries but still we'll take up a few so okay. first is can satyagraha 
be taken as the weapon of the strong or the strongest what is your view because many people say this is otherwise when one cannot fight against violence or violent means we take to satyagraha so thinking about gandhian gandhian ideas what is your view sir uh, by strong I, i i i i didn't understand what the person is asked by strong yeah yeah because human beings as gandhi said who observe truthfulness who have the conviction to die for their cause people who don't want to kill others rather who want to become martyrs in the in the act not of killing but dying those people are very strong anybody irrespective of social background who or so is convinced of this is capable of taking satyagraha in that sense because the crucial thing is that you must act in a manner where what you demand or what you do does not deliberately hurt the opponent in that kind of situation so for gandhi in that sense meek shall inherit the earth and meek not in the sense of powerless but people who are empowered with truth people who are empowered with the conviction people who are empowered themselves with the willingness to sacrifice their life they are the strong people that's how he defined the strong people there is one question that when we talk about lpg or liberalization in particular and the way indian economy is moving so can we say it is a decline of gandhian ideas or less appreciation for gandhian ideas what is the view that indian model of current liberalization and the gandhian prescriptions for our economic woods so how do you look at this issue it's very interesting that people think that gandhian ideas ever prevailed in fact gandhian ideas have never prevailed in this country after 1947 gandhi became irrelevant to the ruling classes in this country yeah. and people who captured the state power they perpetuated with the state power they perpetuated with the same colonial structure they perpetuate with the police of the same kind people who are at a distance from the people people and how can you call gandhian ideas ever accepted in fact is very interesting which i want to tell you gandhian ideas are the most dangerous ideas and in a letter which uh, one of the capitalists wrote to ambalar sarabhai he said that we may be happy that gandhian movement in the 30s and 40s is useful to us he said but gandhi is teaching a very dangerous lesson to the people of this country and if they imbibe this lesson they will never allow any authoritarian government to exist in this country and he says gandhi is dangerous not only for colonial rulers gandhi is also dangerous for rulers when swaraj will be there so his is a philosophy of protest of establishing a truthful and equal society and not somebody so my short answer is gandhism is not only decline gandhian gandhian idea will thrive in this country the future belongs to gandhi because the future if at all protest movement have to organize in this country they will have to organize on gandhian methods sir uh, we have indeed in fact asked to ma'am madam also but we want your opinion in this regard as well to what extent did the christian mystical ideas as represented by saint francis of assisi tolstoy or andrews familiar with tagore's mystical uh, mind strengthen gandhi's struggle against he hegemonic orthodoxy and hegemonic polity uh, i uh, whatever i have learned from shashi and right. because she has studied all these ideas and uh, the whole ideas gandhi never stood for any kind of hegemonic ideas because but the systems which you create fight for become hegemonic after all gandhi was fighting for all people like gandhi they fight for equality brotherhood and fraternity but the movement which they lead after them that movement crystallizes society which observes power relations in that sense so there is a no society which does not have power relations this happens despite the fact from christ till gandhi 
people have fought for equality people have fought for society which is based on love and yet human society every time it it such people come they tend to follow them and after they are gone the power relations gets reestablished in that society hegemonic relations get reestablished in that society okay sir so there is one question a um, bit interesting could india achieve independence minus gandhi or gandhian way of struggle what is your I, view i think anybody india could have achieved struggle if they have understood the strategy of non violent non cooperation rejected insurrection rejected constitutionalism and this strategy is by the way even valid till today suppose tomorrow the indian communist parties dissolve themselves and they all follow the gandhian strategy there is a possibility of a left wing revival in this country but not on the communist ideas not on the ideas of lenin mao and marx but on gandhian ideas because gandhian ideas i said are subversive of power relations they are subversive against those who exploit in society so gandhi is very dangerous and probably the left also thinks that gandhi is dangerous for them also because they are interested in what they call capturing power in this country gandhi says in his name nobody can capture power so there is one question when we talk about satyagraha non violence and such issues can we just leave out swaraj so little bit word from you on swaraj so if you want to... gandhi gandhi said anybody who get convinced that there should be truthfulness there should be love and equality they have a desire to say i am free and willing to sacrifice a life for that freedom that person is free in society therefore the unfreedom comes from the desire to save your skin with with the rulers to save your skin against the oppressors anybody who says my life is at stake freedom or death is a free person in that sense he or she has already attained swaraj and gandhi says if a society is full of large number of such people that society probably have the possibility of attaining swaraj not a society which is a society of conformists not a society in which people lack conviction not a society in people try to say let others speak why should i speak so gandhi says you will not have your freedom free you have to pay for it yes so there is one question let us take last question you know how marx described indian society as rural uh, with the caste system the marxian some of them they put a question the uh, indian rulers and landlords they were the servile tools of british despotism so how did gandhi work with them when he had this struggle for independence and how can we simply compromise is there a compromise that this is a this is a this is a marxist accusation which was made by a british author whom the indian communist follow in his book r p dat india today gandhi's whole question is not that i don't see if somebody is capitalist i don't see somebody is uh, feudal i am putting certain conditions if people are willing to follow this condition then they are willing to do as kabir said jo ghar jale apna chale hamare sath anybody who is willing to follow my conditions is most welcome to join me in that sense and one must understand many people of property who joined gandhi they lost their property they became bankrupt many of them they were willing to spend all the money for the causes which gandhi said in that sense the question is gandhi said it's not the question of capitalism but if you if even if you are poor but you are capitalist minded if you are money minded if your mind is full of greed you are no different from a birla or any other kind of situation in that so therefore the problem is not he said i i am willing to associate with each other therefore gandhian movement large number of landlords who rejected their properties and were willing to go to jail can you imagine large number of rich peasants large number of capitalists they say okay we are willing to go to jail and that is the condition gandhi accepted in that sense he says if you are willing to sleep with me on the ground then it's absolutely there is no problem you may be a rich person yeah. okay take a few last answer there is a question which i wanted not to ask but i'm tempted to ask please do yeah and somebody asks what is the future of 
Gandhian movements in India, or for that matter in the world, future of Gandhian movement or Gandhian way of having a movement for the people? What is your view, sir? Firstly, I'll say there are no such thing as Gandhian movements. People claim to be Gandhian. If people sit on a dharna for four days, they think they are following Gandhian methods. If they go to observe fast for a week, they said the Gandhian man. This is not Gandhi. Gandhi has put forward these four things which I said, truthfulness, conviction, and the desire to suffer and to stake your life on the cause if you are convinced. If you are this, any movement, any people, irrespective of where do they come from, if they are willing to take their stand on that, that movement is a Gandhian movement. And to some extent, in post-independence India, Anna Hazare sought to do that. And his whole persona was such that people thought probably a, a Gandhian follower has come to deliver us from all the lies and the truth and the hypocrisy. And Indian parliament was running hither and thither, try to convince him not to lose his life. They thought if he lost his life, we'll have another Gandhi on our hand. And that will be very difficult to handle in that sense. So they promised him everything that we'll do whatever you, but leave your fast. And once they left fast, they all went back from those promises. But despite that, that movement left enough of sedimentation and a kind of awareness and psychological state, which later on was utilized by Kejri Wall to lay the foundation of a new kind of political party which promised a different kind of politics. But we know they have become now the same kind of politicians and we are given the same kind of politics. Okay, thank you, sir. So okay. uh, on behalf of uh, Mizoram University, Ek Bharat Sheshtara team, on behalf of my um, co-organizer, Professor K. Robin, uh, uh, I have the honor of proposing a formal vote of thanks to this national webinar. So to begin with, I thank and express my gratitude to Professor Bhavan Jos, uh, Madam Professor Sasi Joshi, our Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor K.R.A. Sambhashiva Rao, uh, my team members of Ek Bharat Shesh Bharat, and our partner university in Bihar, Mahatma Gandhi Central University Motihari, my colleagues here, all the esteemed participants, our friends in the university, uh, my ICT support team, Dr. Turanga, Mr. Suraj, and their team, and all the people who have made this webinar a grand success. So I have no words to express my happiness that with very little input from our side, we could organize this, and we had the opportunity to listen to two of the excellent speakers of this country on different facets of Gandhi, Gandhian ideas. So on behalf of Mizoram University, I express my heartfelt thanks to all of you. We, we hope that within a few days, if time permits, then we can have many more such occasions. Mr. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, uh, sir, ma'am, uh, apart from this, exclusively, uh, particularly on behalf of the Department of History as well, I would like to give thanks to both of you. Uh, and uh, with your permission, we would like to hear more from you in the few, near future uh, with the Department of History and Ethnography. Uh, it's indeed an excellent, uh, you know, presentation, a lecture that you have both delivered to us. It really gave a new, completely new insight into uh, uh, Gandhi. And so we'd love to hear more from you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Thank Namaste. You. And we